have some little icons from down the bottom. Sorry? I've lost the Explorer icons. So oh, that's because I changed my we're, in, we're, in, we're in full mode. So, one of the ways is to do Alt Tab. Just Alt Tab? Yeah. Okay. That takes us through. So I can just go there then. Yeah. But. It is going to be the case that while you're in here, you're not going to get access to that. So well, you could escape and pick it up. All right. But that means when but you come I back to this, you're, you're there going there to have to. Yeah. So like most things in life, there isn't an ideal yeah, solution. Be a bit of fiddling. Yes. Okay. All right. No, and I will sit there, I'll and if it's fine. a challenge, <laughs> I will come up. And if not, I'll just. Marvel at whatever you do. Well, okay. I'll do something. I know. That's all you need. It took about a minute to learn. Uh, it took me much longer to go. Lecture theatre. Had it? A lecture theatre. Yeah. So hilarious. Has it been a while? Oh, I gave a lecture at Murdoch earlier in the year, or early in this semester. It had been redone. And all my friends that I saw there were like, I've lost my job. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> well, they've really got their priorities right, haven't they? Well, you know, build it and we, they will come. Is this the right height for you? Yeah. Or do you want, would you rather have a little mic? Nah, I don't know. I'll just do what I decide to do once I'm in the time. <laughs>
Hello. Hi. My name is Faye Davidson. I work at Equity and Diversity at UWA. Um, I'm delighted to introduce this afternoon's guest speaker, Dr Katie Ellis. I first met Katie when she was writing about gender in Star Wars and why there is no wheelchair access at the Logies and her research um, piece, You Look Normal to Me. We've worked together as fellow students, colleagues, campaigners and friends for many years since then. Six years after acquiring disability, her sceptical interest in social cons constructions of disability was confirmed as a very real issue when she discovered the disability, disability studies books all stored on the top shelf of the library. <laughs> this was one of the first of many times that Katie educated me as an equity practitioner in the social construction of disability. Her publications are extensive and have appeared in many journals and newspapers and include A Quest Through Chaos, Dolls with Disabilities, Taste is the Enemy of Creativity, Live Fast, Die Young, Become Immortal. Her books include Dis Disabling Diversity and With Others, Disability in the Media, Disability in New Media, Disability, Obesity and Ageing. She has worked on film production and holds an Australian Research Council DECRA looking at digital television and disability. Katie is a Senior Research Fellow at the Department of Internet Studies at Curtin University. Please welcome Katie. Okay, thank you everyone and, and thank you Faye and Bev for um, asking me to come along today to talk about um, access and new media. Um, so uh, this, this talk that I'm going to give today really comes out of work that I did on this book that I've displayed up the front here, um, recently out on paperback, that I did with um, my colleague Mike Kent, um, Disability in the Media. When I started writing this book, I was actually working here at UWA 
um, in disability support, helping students with disabilities get their course materials in accessible formats and um, trying to convince the lecturers that this was a really good idea and they should be organised at the beginning of semester. But uh, then when I um, finished the book, I'd um, gone over to the dark side and I was, um, I was a lecturer actually at Murdoch University, another uni here in Perth. So I think in writing the book I came to it from a few different but um, sort of equally important perspectives. So what we look at in the book um, is how digital technologies, things we would describe as Web 2.0, um, so things like user-generated content, um, and the way they create disabling environments when they shouldn't. So our main argument in the book is that we should be able to access digital information in any format that we want, um, in any number of different ways depending on, um, on our different needs or our different styles of learning, for example. So um, when we began writing the book, we really felt that the, uh, the situation was really bad. The web was becoming more and more complex. There was more visual information on the web without textual descriptions of what was going on. So um, we, we saw that people with disabilities were being unnecessarily locked out of participation on the web. Um, but so something happened when we were writing our last few chapters that changed the direction of the book a little bit and our work since then. And that was that um, people with disabilities sort of began protesting the inaccessibility of the web um, and that everybody, not just people with disabilities, people with and without disabilities, um, really wanted this individualised web experience. Um, and it just sort of all of a sudden became really good business practice for, um, to make platforms accessible for people with disabilities. And um, people without disabilities were uh, finding the flexibility useful too. Now, the example Mike and I always like to use when we talk about this change is Facebook. So um, I don't know if Facebook's come up at this conference very much. But um, so wh when we were first thinking about how the web was inaccessible to people with disabilities, Facebook was the example that was often held up as being unnecessarily limiting for people with vision impairment mainly. And then during the pe people with disabilities started protesting this, created petitions on Facebook itself. And then the, um, the American Foundation for the Blind actually um, together with Facebook, conducted an overhaul of the entire site to make it more accessible to people with vision impairment. And then Media Access Australia actually described Facebook as a good choice for people with disability wanting to use social networking sites. So that, that was in 2009. And then after that, Facebook overhauled again and became inaccessible again. <laughs> you know, they always change that interface very annoying. So, but what we see with Facebook now is they've got an accessibility team to try, try to maintain a commitment to accessibility going forward. That's a recent development last year. So, um, so in, in this talk today I really want to um, question the way that we think about access and particularly access within the digital environment. But I also think that we need to be a bit optimistic about it um, and to think about the opportunities that we are seeing um, emerging through uh, the digital campus um, for all students and not just students with disabilities and how rethinking access is helping that to happen. So in this talk, I'm going to argue that access is a way people have of relating to their environments and. Um, has particular significance in an educational setting where different people have got different styles of learning and different ways of relating to the, to the world. So, was it control tab? Alt tab. See, I'm in internet studies and I'm still learning keyboard shortcuts. <laughs> I just want to show you a clip. Some of you may have seen this um, film it's made by the, the Disability Rights Commission in the UK and it's basically sort of flipping things around and presenting um, people without disabilities as being disabled, putting them in certain situations. 
Okay, I think I need a two-handed person <laughs> to do this. Thank you. So I'm, I'm not going to show you the whole clip. I'm just going to um, pick it up. From We're <laughs> <laughs> being confounded. Three-handed. There we go. All right, I'll just press play, and this is Robert as he's attempting to go to a job interview. Like I say, I think you're very brave. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Robert Kesey. I'm, I'm here for the for the uh, interview. Yeah, sorry, I'm late. I, I couldn't. Think. I'm sure that's okay. Taxi. So I can't, can't Oh, they shouldn't be long. No, no, but I, I just can't. You're welcome. Come in. What's going on? He's able-bodied. <laughs> How good of you to come. <laughs> Why don't you take a seat? Take as much time as you need. Well, hey, I, I had a friend who had all his limbs once. It's great. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't get it. I mean, it's as if they weren't even listening to me. Oh, I don't know. Uh, listen, I've got to go. I'll tell you about it later, okay? Yeah, eight o'clock. I'm wearing a light grey suit. So next, Robert tries to get onto a wheelchair accessible bus and he's, he's told he's not allowed, can't get on. So um, to the series of short films is called Talk and what it's trying to do is portray a society where the non-disabled people are the pitied <laughs> minority and the people with disabilities lead the full and active lives. And so, so other, other sort of scenarios in, in these films, if you go check them out on YouTube, they're really quite funny. You know, he goes to a nightclub, he tries to go on a blind date, gets put, you know, in a dodgy spot in the restaurant, and so on. So, um, so, so in this world, Robert's the one who's, who's disabled, um, but he's, he's not disabled, he's disabled by the, the social environment that he's trying to exist in. So that company never even thought that somebody with Robert's abilities um, would show up to their interview, so they didn't think about including him in that way. Um, so if we think about this in terms of people with disabilities, in reality, um, these kinds of things happens a lot. Um, so as a way to counter that is to start thinking about disability as a, as a problem with society rather than the individual's body and the kinds of things it can and can't do. So I've got a diagram here of what we call the social model of disability, which basically argues just that, that disability exists in the reaction, the outside reactions to the body rather than the individual's body. So um, um, people with disabilities um, experience different ba barriers depending on their own personal individual situations, but usually these kinds of barriers can be grouped 
as environmental, so things like inaccessible buildings, services and languages, um, in terms of people's attitudes in reaction to um, disability, prejudice and discrimination, um, or organisational, so the inflexible practices, procedures and people. Um, in that clip, Robert experiences barriers related to the physical environment, um, prejudicial attitudes and the inflexible organisational procedures in the job interview. So um, students with disabilities would also experience these sorts of um, access problems. Um, I'm just going to skip ahead to... Um, a quote from um, a student with disability leaving high school and talking about the kind of choice they'll make about university. So this student says that her choice of university is limited because of the physical um, accessibility issues she could potentially encounter. And she's saying she, because of her disability she'd have less choice to be able to decide on the um, university she wanted to go to. So thinking about this in terms of the... Um, of the social model of disability, um, the barriers are related to the way the university is set up rather than the student's individual disability. Um, so um, looking at the, the wheelchair user, so if a wheelchair user is attempting to enter a building accessible only by stairs, then they're di disabled by the absence of ramps rather than their inability to walk. Or um, if students are only given visual styles of learning, for example, um, such as reading from a board or listening to a, a PowerPoint presentation, um, then the, the student with the, the vision impairment um, is disabled when the alternative formats aren't made available to them. So as the, um, the student with vision impairment at the back of the classroom there being asked to um, read the homework off the board, um, So I've got here um, a, a story about how a student with vision impairment would write, an es write and submit an essay um, in 1981. And I put that there just so you could have a think about how this student would um, probably approach the same task quite differently now. So in 1981 they've got two options of either um, tape recording the final product and giving the tape recording to their lecturer or having someone type it up and then submit it or typing up their, their initial rough copy of the assignment and having someone proofread it and then, and, correct, and then being able to correct it, then submitting it. And now we could have the student participating in this exercise in a much more independent way through the use of accessible adaptive technologies and screen readers. So... Um, this example shows that um, things do change and technology does change. And that's what Mike and I were really interested in when we were writing our book. Um, so we were looking at the digital world like the wheelchair and ramp. And um, so what we were saying was that it can be entered in different ways if it's made accessible, usable and compatible with the assistive technologies. But we still, still do need to be aware that... Um, some of the digital campus can be, is still inaccessible, even though the accessibility potential is there. Uh, so um, here's a quote from our book. So what we had to say is that um, digital information was different than the, the blackboard you saw from earlier. Um, so once a piece of information or content is digitised, form is significantly transformed, whereas a, a work written on a page is locked in that format. Once something becomes digital, we can access it in a number of different ways. So um, I've got a few examples there from the Braille tablet shown in sign language um, screen reader, um, and that we should be able to hook everything up so any number of different people should be able to access it in the way they want, where they want. So. Um, it does, it does sound like a, a utopia there. So we, and we, are, we were talking about a digital disability utopia, um, but we, we weren't, we're not alone in that. Um, Tim Berners-Lee, who's the inventor of the World Wide Web, he, um, he, he saw the web as a, a network and a platform that would be most powerful the more people that could be connected to it. And he actually, um, he actually singled out people with disabilities as a group that should be able to access 
the internet and he, so he's saying um, power of the web is its universality and access by everyone regardless of disability is essential to achieving that. And um, so I just saw Tim Berners-Lee at the, the most recent W3C conference in Rio and um, he, there he, he made this offhanded comment that the web is half social, half technical. So people make decisions to, for the way information is um, produced and how that can be accessed. So, um, so Tim Berners-Lee saw um, digital information as empowering and um, ab able to be accessed in many different formats, text, image, sound, multimedia, by any kind of assistive technology. Um, but as the web's developed, that has been thwarted and um, disabling design and, and overly complex um, platforms have um, prevented some people from participating. Uh, we're seeing the um, web used a lot in, in education now and I've got um, a few references here for people that, including myself down the bottom there, um, who've looked at this in terms of disability and what the web means for um, including people with disabilities in higher education. So um, Lou and Hamill, they say it offers an innovative way to bypass the effects of Im impairment that can prevent a student from participating in a university education. And so their, their example for that is um, accessible digital books as, as a way um, of including more students with disability. And Mullen in 2007 says, you know, participating on online platforms mean you don't have to disclose certain aspects of yourself such as physical impairment. Um, so students with disabilities can sort of blend in as non-disabled in those situations. Um, so I think we need, we need to question these sorts of claims that come up. While they're not untrue, think about the kinds of platforms that are used. So, for example, on Second Life, a, student, a wheelchair user won't necessarily need to identify as a wheelchair user in Second Life. But um, what about the student with dyslexia who all of a sudden is outed as someone with dyslexia in the online environment when perhaps in the classroom they, they wouldn't be. So there are a couple of sides to all of these um, arguments. And Altry and Quad, they, they argue that adjustments introduced to assist the students with disabilities actually um, have benefits for the non-disabled population as well. So an example of that is Lectopia, initially introduced to um, assist students with disabilities wanting to access higher education and now, you know, I don't think you could do without it in the university setting and certainly a lot of students could not do without it, would not accept if you didn't record your lectures, make them available. Um, so, and a couple of years ago I, I wrote a paper about how students with disabilities were using mainstream um, Web 2.0 platforms to participate in higher education and um, what I was arguing is that um, by doing so these students were fostering inclusion and that the sorts of uh, um, platforms I was looking at were Foursquare to Wayfind around campus, um, Facebook to make social connections, um, file sharing to get those accessible books that Lou and Hamill talking about in their article and also things like blogging. I actually interviewed a, a student with disability who was blogging about her um, desire to make everything accessible and how she did that. So I just want to um, suggest that um, making um, online digital platforms accessible for students with disabilities actually benefits the entire student population. Um, so for example, um, alternative text is a good example of this. So. Um, Images, if we provide alternative text for images, we give more information about what um, we're trying to communicate, what those images are being used for in the learning environment. So um, they, they allow access by screen readers and they also provide other learners with the additional course information. And so accessibility in this way isn't just accessibility, it's um, providing greater academic insight. And um, 
So I just would like to talk a bit about the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which are they are now guided by this acronym PAW, which means perceivable, operable, understandable and robust. So um, this Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0, um, they, they aim to guide the web designers now and also in the future and they encourage flexibility and um, consider the needs and capabilities of individual users. Um, so web, WCAG 2.0 emphasises principles in a way that allow for greater flexibility and put user needs first. Um, so perceivable, um, one of the main keys to accessibility is ensuring that content is transformable from one format to another um, so that it enables your readers to perceive the same thing in different ways. And that goes down to um, operable, uh, which means that you can't make content device specific, for example, not mouse only, so make sure your page can be navigated with a keyboard only or mouse only, depending on how people access it according to their needs. Um, understandable, writing things in plain language um, and using consistent and intuitive navigation and robust. This, the robust um, principle basically refers to um, future developments. So um, your readers should be able to choose their own technologies to access the site and that allows them to customise their technologies to meet their needs. Um, so basically what these guidelines are doing is highlighting the flexibility and recognising that different people access um, the same information in different ways. And this is something that Mike and I talked about in the book as Accessibility 2.0 and a new way of thinking about accessibility. Um, that is a way that recognises the importance of the, the guidelines, but also the fact that basically now everyone wants a personalised web experience or they have different learning styles. Um, so, so disability becomes fluid, dependent on social structures and is no longer considered in terms of an incapacity. Um, increasing use of Web 2.0 and other digital technologies in tertiary education can result in a greater inclusion of people um, with disability as adaptive technologies can put people um, with disability on the same level of people without disability who are also using customised and individualised ways to access information. So um, since, since our book and, and all these changes in accessibility and in the online environment, even as we were writing the book, we, um, we've come up with a, a further development in our theory. So when we wrote the book, this was our initial theory that there were three stages of accessibility and um, access online. Um, we argued that the first phase was when um, digital technologies are accessible but they're not widely distributed. Um, so the first, so in these cases, design decisions that will exclude people with disability have yet to be made. Um, so, for example, with the early web being largely text-based was probably um, more accessible to people with disabilities, but the people able to access that environment had, had to be very skilled in other areas. So um, the second stage of access is where a particular platform or service is um, popular, but it's not accessible. So in this case, the platforms achieved a large distribution before any thought has been made for accessibility um, for people with disabilities. And the, um, the third stage occurs when one of these platforms, such as Facebook, for example, um, that was previously inaccessible is then changed or retrofitted to, um, to become accessible and inclusive. So what Mike and I are now talking about in our work is our fourth stage um, of accessibility that we see is emerging now, which we call being born accessible, so being accessible from the very beginning. Um, so um, with accessible design for people with disabilities applied from the foundation and then maintained as the platform becomes widely distributed. So an example that we're looking at is Google+. Uh, even though there are accessibility um, 
problems with this um, platform and Media Access Australia has written about this in their um, report on social media accessibility. Um, they did attempt to focus on accessibility from the beginning and they actually, um, before the network was launched, they, they tweeted, we considered accessibility of Google Plus from day one. Find something we missed, press, press send feedback link and let us know. So they put it out there to the community, if this platform is not accessible, let us know, we'll fix it. They had the commitment to making um, that platform accessible. Um, so while, while it's not perfect at this stage, um, we see the, um, the commitment to making the network accessibility and the willingness to work with people to do that um, as an important development. So uh, that's it for me. I was going to um, talk a bit about Apple. Do we have time? I haven't seen another. Okay. So, um, so I just want to finish by talking about... Um, some, something that sort of occurs between this retrofit and the born accessible, and that, that's Apple computing. Um, so, so when I was working here at UWA, we, we actually had a guy from Apple come and, and give us a demo in the disability office to try to encourage us to get our students to use Apple products. Um, so the, the iPhone had just been redone with the new operating system and I remember this, this guy giving the demo, he, he, um, he, he very excitedly said to his phone, play all my David Bowie songs and it did and he's going, see, look at this, this would be great for people with vision impairments. Um, so I was sort of a bit sceptical at the time about what their motivations exactly were and why they were suddenly focusing on access and I asked him and he said, well, we just thought it was the right idea. You know, he said we were, we were up to upgrading our operating system and thought it was a good thing to do anyway. But we can see now it's, it's really paid off for them in their mainstream markets, you know, with people now becoming dependent on Siri and things like that. So, and actually when they launched the iPad, apps had to be ex accessible on the iPad to, um, to be approved. And you actually, it was the default setting to make an iPad app that it was accessible. And so in order for people to make an inaccessible app, they had to consciously make that decision to be inaccessible, which some, some people did. And I um, have a very bad recording of Stevie Wonder doing an impromptu concert, um, talking about... <laughs> First of all, he starts... Very bad at this time. He starts talking about making cities more accessible to people with disabilities and how this is something we should be concentrating on. And then he just suddenly starts talking about the iPhone around five minutes here. Spirit of caring and moving the world forward, Steve Jobs. <laughs> Because there is nothing on the iPhone or the iPad that you can do that I can't do. As a matter of fact, I can be talking to you, you can be looking at me, and I can be doing whatever I need to do, and you don't even know what I'm doing. Yeah! Can you do some Michael Jackson? Can you do some Michael Jackson? Can you just want to rock up with you? Yeah. Yo, Ann, is he that spinner? Okay, I just wanted to show you that because of what he said about there's nothing you can do on the iPhone that I can't do. And that he saw that technology as an inclusive and an equaliser, putting people with disabilities on the same level as people without. And that's, that's it for me today. Is there any questions? Thank you, Katie. Uh, I was just wondering, is, are there any questions for Katie before we move on? Um, oh, there's a question. Um, thank you, Katie, for this presentation. And I think it's something that we have struggled with um, 
at my institution, which is Deakin University, you know, how do we create accessibility that spreads the university and all of our digital presence, which really is the other drive behind we take too. So I wondered if um, you were aware of some good practice universities within Australia who've really worked this out, you know, to create systems so that they can achieve, you know, like compliance by the end of next year. Because I think sort of it's something that, that we are pushing hard, but I, I don't want to take on as equity and diversity. I think this is something that people need to do, you know, like in in our IT functions and our, you know, like learning support yeah, functions yeah. and so on. I, I think we, we're driving the message, but they have to do it. Yeah. And I wonder if you have well, um, I think you, the, it will be the, the web officers and the, the IT who need to drive it, but you need to champion it and be the cheerleaders for it. I don't know about any particular universities that I would point out as good practice, um, but I do know that Media Access are looking into this issue, so maybe if you contacted them, they might have some information for you or if everyone contacted them and, and said, you know, this is an issue, we're concerned about it, they will take it on and do the research into it and get some good guidelines out about what to do. Bev? Um, it's just an observation. Your, your comments at uh, the beginning about the social model of disability fit very nicely with one of the themes emerging out of this conference, which is about the power and privilege of the majority of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's just that there's a whole layer of construction around um, technology that basically is, 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 is cementing the disadvantage that occurs. Mm. And, and that comes back to what I was saying earlier where I said, you know, I want to be optimistic about this but, but cautious too. You know, so people will think if I'm giving you a digital document, must be accessible, you know, met their obligations but that's not always the case. Although you can make PDFs accessible. You can. You can, there are. Make them PDFs, that's the whole thing. Yeah. Legislation says it has to be a PDF. It doesn't have to be that particular PDF that you send out by the people. It's just PDF that the PDF has. Are you saying people are putting PDFs out? Yeah, they're putting them out there. Yeah. 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 Ye
students and then the same material is being developed for a MOOC, what kind of responsibilities do we have to supporting people who have signed up in a MOOC but who may not actually be our students, but mm. they are accessing our learning material. They are. There's lots and lots of issues around this, but anyway. I'll pass across if anybody wants to carry on the I, I recommend the Deacon MOOC to you, Judy, <laughs> which, which, which wasn't necessarily born um, accessible, but we have, we have put lots and lots of work, so there was some um, effort made to make it as accessible as they could, and then they've done some retrofitting um, as they went along, so have a look on I think also, just on that, MOOCs, from sort of my limited understanding, they use platforms like YouTube, is that correct, some of them? Using third-party applications like YouTube. They, you know, they many. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's a, it's a bit of a complex situation there, where you're relying on that platform to be accessible, and they've got their own responsibilities to do that. But you, as an educational institution, want to use that. So. I think because it's such a big issue, and I certainly know it's being talked about in a lot of universities as you know the mm. future of mm. education heading yeah. in that space, that it'll be really important to, to raise those yeah. issues of accessibility and, and the pedagogy right from the start mm. if we can. Are there any more questions? Okay. Um, Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Faye. Oh, stay there. Okay. There's just a few housekeeping things before we let Katie go. Um, the first is that tomorrow, well, I believe we're we're gathering in another building, so it'll be across the way over there in the arts building. Um, Malcolm's also asked me to let you know that there's an Olympia Dukakis movie on tonight called Cloudburst at 8, p 8 p.m. at the rooftop cinemas. He says it's going to be great. See him if you want to go. It's on the corner of James Street and Lake Street, and. Anne has a message as well about a really good cause. <laughs> Terribly important message. Is uh, there any thanks, thanks very much indeed. Um, my name's Anne Stewart um, and I'm going to do what Dawn Hoff um, referred to as coming out because I've got no choice right now because I'm selling tickets uh, from uh, the fundraiser for Dykes on Bikes in Queensland and we're selling an absolutely fantastic uh, prize which is going the money is raised going towards our charity which is a group called Open Doors. And Open Doors operates on a shoestring. They provide, uh, they're the only uh, group in uh, Queensland that provides support to very young people, 12 years of age to about 18, uh, who are homeless or at risk of becoming homeless because of their, uh, their sexual orientation and, or, and their gender identity. So it, the money goes to a good cause. But the good news is it's got an awesome prize. The prize is uh, that you, uh, the winners, um, and, and men are very welcome to buy tickets. The, uh, they're very welcome to take advantage of most aspects of the prize. The only, only <laughs> thing is that they have to nominate uh, the two women to get the, the real highlight, which is that uh, there's the prizes that include the return airfare from Brisbane to Sydney, and if you're from another state, I'm sorry, but we, um, you might have to try to negotiate that, but we can't change that. Uh, two nights accommodation Park Royal Hotel on Darling Harbour. But Kiwis, you can actually buy tickets on this as well. You can fly over from Auckland or <laughs> to Brisbane. Uh, but the real highlight is that uh, two women will be picked up from the hotel by the Queensland chapter of Dykes on Bikes. You will become a Queensland Dykes on Bikes for a day. You don't have to be gay, it's fine. <laughs> Um, see you tomorrow. <laughs>
Okay. Are you right? Thank you. Did Chris text me and say he'll get Stella? I like him when he picks her up. Right? I think she likes him too. My dad oh, oh, all an upside down day. Did I show you my video of Stella? Thank you, Fev. It's not going to be sold in a pro in a, It's not going to be sold. And I, that, that's why I was going on about the State Records Act, because that's only an act that's about three years old. I'm always shocked when I look at the, the government websites and they have their disability yeah. inclusion yeah. plans in PDF. Yeah. And it says click here. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone read anything? Yeah, I know, I know. So, so yeah. Um, there's a lot of challenges ahead. And I thought that point that Judy was making about MOOCs, you know, I don't think they've got, they, don't, they haven't got accessibility as the no, forefront of their mind. No, I think they've got numbers at the forefront. Yes, they have, mind, and reputation. But, you know, if they start to get a reputation as like, I don't know the stamp, I haven't looked at the Stanford MOOC, but they're doing a lot of Is it. Is UWA doing MOOC? Yeah, we're getting into it. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yeah, we're getting into it. David Glantz, who I don't think is the greatest disability act, uh, um, advocate, you know, access advocate. Greg Madsen's now the yeah. president of Blind Citizens uh, Australia, oh, I think. I saw um, an article he wrote on Ramp Up a couple of months ago. He's leading a, a class action or something against the ABC. Is he? <laughs> yeah. Remember they had that audio description accessibility trial? Last, well, last year they had a, a technical trial over a couple of months oh. to have a few different programs on the ABC audio described for vision oh, impaired yeah. Yeah, no, viewers. And... The government at the time didn't make a commitment to continuing it on, and neither is this one. You know, no, no, that won't. Yeah. You know, so he's got a coalition of Good people on him. together Good on him. making noise about it. Because he's also now on the board of Vision Australia, I think. He's on a lot of boards. Yeah, but I he's... used to be on the um, ministerial advisory one with him, and he was on... He's going to go down to part time next year. Because I said, oh, "What about your day job?" And he said, "No, I'll probably go to part time next year." Because, yeah, and I said, "I think it's a it's a mark of recognition of his work yeah, and his advocacy." Yeah, and, yeah. and you know, you've got yeah, to have he's people. He's a superstar, really. Well, I uh, he had the benefit of right. having sight. You know, I think he had sight for about oh, four, because twenty-five fif years. For fifteen years, was it? Didn't he start going blind? I interviewed him about it, and he, was, he said when he was twenty-five. He okay, so he started losing it in his teenagers, yeah. and he started being cycled around motorbike around Australia, did all those yeah, things when yeah. he had still sight, and that may have positioned him better. Oh, well, it doesn't mean he's any less... Um, blind. Yeah, yeah, that's right, <laughs> any less blind or any less confounded by technology yeah. than everyone else, you know. Yeah. Anyway, that was great. He's thank hilarious. You so, he's a lovely guy. We, I was on this council with him, and the, the admin person sent out the agenda or the minutes or something, and she said, you know, this highlighted in yellow is what we want him to refer to, and he like, what's yellow? <laughs> 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 I was yeah, so embarrassed. Yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> Good on him. Yeah. Good on him. That was great, though. I'm glad you did that. Yeah. It was Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Ray. I'm sorry okay. I couldn't attend the rest of the conference. No, I, just, I think you've got I was your just own. out like, one last week, so yeah. I've got my own conference fatigue. And you've got your own day job as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'm pleased yeah. you came. Yes. Did, and did you give her the. Yeah, I've got it in my yeah. bag. It's cool. a gift that says thank you but gives to someone else. Well, that's good. <laughs> I, like, I like those. Yeah, good. I like giving them for Christmas. Oh, I good, good. Good. <laughs> I don't, I haven't. Where did I put my name tag? Ah, here it is. I had the biscuit. I said to email media access. That's going to be so funny because I know the... Um, Scott Hollier works there, and um, he said he wants to get something up and going about education, making education accessible, but he has to convince his boss. Well, that's terrible. So, so I hope that helps.
to get that paper out. Do you know at the conference last week, I got questions that were, what someone questioned my methodology. And I was, I was so upset about it. And then the next day, I went to this brilliant talk and he asked exactly the same question. I just asked mm -hmm. a couple of the chairs to reiterate. I heard that you said that um, <coughs> that we're in the arts building tomorrow, but also people can bring their luggage with them because they're like chairs. So we'll just store them somewhere <coughs> in the back of the So I managed to catch both other rooms. It's the, well, not the one that Fiona Burrows is in because I don't know what she looks like. And the session's already started. But <coughs> I'll try and catch them at the end just to say, oh shit, I've left the desk on um, And I'm like, technology's in Anyway, so I don't know why I said that, but basically, if anyone asks, they can bring their luggage to All me. right, okay, good to know. I should have said it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Do you want the last ball thing? No, I won't have the last ball thing. <laughs>